All right, so today we have Eric Gerzel back with us again, Assistant Professor of Nutrition at WIU. Um, just going to be talking about intermittent fasting and kind of what it does, what it doesn't do, the different types, because there's a ton of different types of ways that you can go about fasting. Um, so I'm going to just let him kind of take it and talk a little bit about, um, you know, how we go about fasting on a daily basis anyway. Yeah. So uh, the, the premise of this kind of following in line with our last discussion was for people who are considering, you know, intermittent fasting as another potential way to maybe lose weight um, or for people who are like stuck at home during quarantine who are looking to maybe reduce their caloric restriction. You might have heard of like intermittent fasting as a potential option. So I figured this would be a, a fun thing to kind of delve into when you brought it to my attention. Um, first and foremost one of my favorite stories is that i think it's always mind-blowing when people break down the word breakfast and not realize that every day they have a fast when they go to bed right <laughs> yeah and it's, it's something that once you hear it you go oh duh um intermittent fasting kind of takes it a, a step further right so instead of going to bed for eight hours and then waking up and eating breaking your fast um intermittent fasting there's a lot of different protocols like you said um one of the common ones that's kind of Going into it without full day fast is what we call time restricted feeding. And this is where you kind of extend that period of not eating uh, a little bit more. And right. so this one is pretty variable in terms of what that length looks like. Some people uh, won't, you know, I don't eat after 10 p.m. And my first meal of the day is going to be noon, right? And you get all of your calories in that window. Typically, the research is for time restricted feeding uh, at least a 12 hour fast. Some research goes up to about 16 hours, uh, maybe even 18 hours. Um, and that's why it's a little bit tough to kind of compare a lot of those studies because obviously a fast for 12 hours is going to be different on the body than maybe an 18 hour fast. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the timings, right? The the day, like the timing throughout the day of when you eat. It, yeah. It has yeah. Even effect. beyond just like the length of the fast itself, are you positioning the fast earlier before bedtime? or later when you wake up, like those kinds of things can definitely change. Um, Cause there is that like, you know, we've talked about before, um, timing of eating, right? Regarding like your circadian rhythm and all that stuff. Right. The, uh, the other two, and these are the two that I think are more commonly viewed as uh, more consistently research, I would say like so rather the, the research itself is a bit more consistent between the studies is what we would refer to as either alternate day fasting, which is like, what your normal calories would be one day, and then the next day you just really bring it down to like five, six hundred calories, and then the next day you go back up to normal healthy calorie consumption, and then back down to five, six hundred calories. Literally alternating day, easy to understand. the The last one is is getting more traction. I'd say more popular, more popularity, uh, and it's what we refer to as like a five two or a modified intermittent fasting, right? Where your normal calories five days a week. And then two days a week, you really drop it down to that five, 600 calorie max uh, threshold. So that's kind of like the three major ways when we talk about intermittent fasting. Um, sometimes you'll have two different people come together and be like, oh, I intermittent fast. Oh, I do too. And then they realize they're kind of talking different languages to each other. Right. Because they're all considered a different uh, form of intermittent fasting. Right. So the base of this though is, I mean, caloric restriction. Uh, that that's the that's the basis of the entire thing is even if you do it alternate day or five to two i mean at some point throughout the week you are restricting the amount of calories you put in your body which i yeah. think is like yeah the end goal um so what does intermittent fasting like really do for your body uh, in terms of studies i know we talked about like it has effects on ketones or insulin um what what does fasting actually really do yeah, well, I think there's maybe two ways to kind of approach that. One is, and, and let's start with the psychological side. Um, a, lo a lot of the reasons why people are maybe considering intermittent fasting is, while it seems a bit odd if you're not in this line of thought, some people will find it easier to severely restrict their calories two days a week than all seven days drop it by 20%, right? Yeah, so yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> And I think that a lot of people kind of go, well, it might be easier seven days a week to just reduce 20% every single day. 
But there's a lot of other people who say, you know what? No, I want to, you know, eat my normal calories five days a week and then two days really drop it down. And, you know, this is when we think about like what's clinically relevant. It really becomes a, a, a matter of options, right? You know, what works with one person might not work with someone else. And if someone has been trying to do the continuous day in and day out um, for months on end and not being too successful with it because maybe they kind of relapse into other maybe unhealthy eating behaviors while they're trying to, to follow a diet. Um, some people might actually find this to be pretty useful. And so there is some people who gravitate towards that. Um, you know, so psychologically, it might be more uh, compliant for a lot of people. A lot of people might be easier to, to handle it. Yeah, absolutely. That's the more biological side of it um, probably relates to the impact that fasting has on our bodies, like physiology, our metabolism, right? So we know that there are so many different hormones and signalings uh, involved in our bodies, uh, both digestive process, but also just basal, like basic life functions, right? So we know that hormones kind of circulate up and down throughout the day. They respond to our food signals. One of the major ones we talked about last time being like insulin. Like we know you eat a meal, your insulin level goes up uh, in response to that carb, uh, the carbohydrate that you've been consuming. And, you know, that we often think about like insulin is managing your blood sugar, but insulin also manages a lot of other things. We refer to it as a pleiotropic hormone. It just, it does a lot. Um, and it also impacts satiety, feeling of fullness. And so, you know, being able to go not just an eight hour fast if you're going to bed, but maybe a 12 hour or even 16 hour fast might actually provide um, a longer period of time without food. And that might actually kind of resensitize uh, in terms of some of the, the theory that's going on with some of the research. You're not you know, spiking the insulin as frequently throughout a day. You're kind of consolidating all of that and you're you're saying, hey, body, you need to adapt to, you know, 12 to 16 hours without food. And we are able to do that as animals. Oh, absolutely. I mean, nowadays, especially, we have just such an ease of access to food. I mean, whenever you want food, you can get it. But yeah. I mean, we had to get to that point, And a long, long time ago, we, we weren't there. We would go 16 hours without food. Uh, I mean, it was just a normal thing. People didn't yeah. have three square meals a day plus like a bedtime snack. That wasn't that wasn't yeah, always a normal. morning snack on the way to work when you like you know right. We we surround ourselves with food, and it's no surprise that we are kind of adapting to this notion of I eat food every three hours, and if I don't, my stomach starts to growl. I start to feel tired. I start to feel you know a little bit um, more more tired. You know. Uh, or cranky even, you know, hangry became right. a term in the past decade, right? Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, personally, away from the research side of it, I think that there is a lot of utility to kind of stepping back and kind of um, resetting and understanding our body's uh, responses and kind of like our own adaptive signals because we know how easily we can be conditioned to overeating. Right. And I mean, just to... Just to hit on it really quick, I mean, it, it's like a stressor to your body uh, not having food for, say, 12 to 16 hours or two days of the week you're having 500 calories as opposed to your normal 2,000. And it, it, it to me, it's a lot like the fitness realm of we know that lifting heavy weights in your 20s will put a stressor on your bones and make you less likely to get osteoporosis later in life because you had that stressor. So, I mean, to me, this seems like a very good comparison of not just like working out but the eating aspect you can stress your body with eating uh, whether it be overeating under eating or doing fasting intermittently yeah. and, and and it's about doing it responsibly right so it, it's this idea that like stress in any capacity can become distress it can be that aberrant not good um chronic stress potentially or even just like severe acute stress but at the same time, some amount of stress is healthy. Some amount of stress is good, right? You know, it, it helps to provide some amount of resiliency, be it either with like the increased bone mineral density, like you were talking, you know, that, that structural pressure on the bones themselves, you know, helps to stimulate higher bone mineral density and more calcium being put on the bone. Is there something to be said about going without food for a period of time and kind of changing some of your body's 
physiology, maybe not like changing in the broad sense, but like reestablishing what normal or what default is. Right. And yeah, you say change. We're not talking about like vast mutations of your body because you're yeah. not eating 500. Like uh, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. It's, it's more of the, your body's insulin. I, I'm going to say resilience. Once you start putting like, a, like, so diabetes is insulin resiliency. Well, diabetes, the, there's the two types. So uh, one of the types is usually caused by either overeating or eating a ton of carbs or sh well, sugar, as we've yeah. seen. And so, I mean, intermittent fasting kind of like cuts all of that back and brings up your in or brings down your insulin resiliency, as the case yeah. may be in this. So. And, and this would probably be a good point. I mean, we both kind of know this, um, having talked about this before. When we talk about any of these diet protocols, if it's continue, continuous caloric restriction um, or intermittent fasting, like intermittent caloric restriction, we're still talking about eating a healthy diet. We're not talking about like, oh, I can eat whatever I want on my eating days and have it be trash food, um, really high calorie, well over what I need. Um, we're still talking about like eating a healthy diet. Um, it's just about what those fast days are where, you know, you are reducing those calories um, and you are kind of building a bit of resiliency for your body to go without food. So I, I got it. It's a balance though. Cause like you could always go too far down that road in my mind. I'm already like, maybe it's the teacher part of me. That's just like thinking cautionary because I think clinically there's a lot of concern about someone who goes, if you starve yourself for two days, that's a slippery slope towards developing disordered eating behaviors. And, and that is a huge concern. Right. So we're still talking about following a healthy diet, you know, trying to, to encourage eating, uh, you know, appropriate portions, meeting your calorie needs, not starving your body, but kind of realigning and re-listening to what your body is kind of talking when it's talking about hunger and satiety. Right. And I mean, it's, especially with the foods today, it's really hard to know um, your like calorie intake when fast food is designed to give you that satiety that you're talking about when it, I mean, it's really just not the best food for you, but you're going to feel full. And yeah. so, I mean, yeah, the healthy balanced diet obviously goes a long way in this. Um, or like when we're talking about the five to two, especially like you can't do five days. And on the last day of day five, just be like, all right, I'm going to just like have a 12 pack of beer, let loose, eat a pizza by myself. Uh, that's not ice cream and just right. go off. Yeah. yeah, it's it's we're not and I think everybody everybody that will watch this knows what a cheat day is, right? Like everybody knows a cheat day. Uh, when we're saying five to two, it's not like all five of those days are cheat days, and then you have two days of fasting. That's I, I, that's I think something yeah. that needs to be realized and, is and and honestly, that even extends to the time restricted feeding. Where even if you go like, you know, 16 hours without eating and you're giving yourself an eight hour window to eat, you know, if you're following intermittent fasting with the goal of weight loss in mind, we are still talking about a healthy diet, a healthy amount of calories within that eight hour window. Um, again, we don't want to develop any type of like food fears or any type of disordered eating behaviors. This is something that you really would want to be um tracking, you know, hopefully with a dietitian or some type of clinician working with you. Absolutely. Um, but it's, but it's still about eating that diet and knowing, all right, where am I at for my daily calories and what would be an appropriate way to reduce that? Do I do it seven days a week reduction or do I break it into this intermittent style? Yeah. And abs in the fitness world, we're taught, um, 3,500 kcals is a pound of fat. And if you want somebody to lose a pound a week is cut 500 calories a day off of their diet, which yeah. is that caloric restriction. But with intermittent fasting, I mean, the five to two, especially you can, I mean, you can do a lot of the legwork on those two days yep. and you don't have to cut 500 calories off. Exactly. And that's, that's really the big crux is like, we would say if you're doing continuous energy restriction, seven days a week, cut 500 calories. And that should be about a pound a week. For most people, if it's 500 less than what their like normal maintenance is, right? On the caloric or the intermittent fasting side of it, yeah, those five days are going to be pretty standard, normal diet. But on those two, you might be cutting upwards of a total of 1,500 to 2,000 calories, depending on your daily needs. Because if you're reducing your normal calories down to 500, 
you know, that's cutting 2000 for me, right? Yeah. So approximately, and you do that two days a week and you achieve the same thing, but on two days. And so, um, you know, there's just this idea that it's another clinical uh, modality that could be followed um, that, again, works for some people, definitely doesn't work for other people. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got to find the one thing that works for them. Um, I mean, I've heard of the meal substitution things. They like the shake diets and, and stuff like that. And, you know, it, like if it works, as long as there's a dietitian in your life telling you that it's OK, I'm cool with it. Um, yeah, yeah. Assuming there's, you know, following adequate blood work that's being checked off, you're not having some nutrient deficiency of sorts. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so I did want to talk about. So we talked a little bit about ketones, and I know our last video is all on the keto diet. And on that, in that video, um, and I'll put the link below if you guys want to check that out. Uh, we talked a little bit about like the keto flu and how your body feels, and I just wanted to see. With intermittent fasting, and I know when I tried it, I was doing the 5-2, but I was doing it in reverse. I was doing it like they would do it on lab mice, and when I tried it, my calorie restriction was five days, and then two of the days, I ate over the amount of calories that I needed. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's just, that's what they do on mice. There's not a lot of human studies on that because that's just cruel. I was, I mean, I was starving my body for five days. Um. But with, with intermittent fasting, yeah, are you we don't recommend for most people, that's something that I trust you to experiment and know your body. Right. And I, the only reason I did it was because I was paying attention. I was keeping track of everything I was putting in my body. I had like two fitness trackers on my phone that was just making sure that I was getting the actual nutrients I needed. But, um, the keto, so the keto diet has the keto flu and with intermittent fasting, I kind of found that when I first started, I was feeling a little bit tired, a little bit cranky. I just didn't have that sustenance that my body needed. Um, is that something that most people are going to feel and then get over with this? Or do you yeah. think it's just, was just me? Cause I was doing it the opposite of what I was supposed to. No, I, I think that it, it's something that, okay. So from the get go, your body kind of resists change in any way. And I think this is why we often talk about like diets not lasting is because, you know, you start to change your behaviors and whether it's psychosocial or regulated by like some hormones, like there's a lot of factors that kind of are like trying to resist you making changes. So we already know that like, if you reduce your calories one day, your, your hormone, you have a hormone called ghrelin in your body that makes you hungry is likely to be elevated the next day. And that correlates very strongly to the amount of energy restriction. So, you know, someone who is eating less, like 25% less calories, you know, five days or uh, seven days a week, they're probably, especially early on, going to be experiencing some more hunger. You know, they are changing the way that their body is used to being fueled. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when you then extend it to intermittent fasting, which is a bit more extreme if we're, you know, being honest about those two days or maybe alternate day fasting. That is a concern. All of a sudden, you restrict a day down to 500 calories, um, you're going to feel very hungry, right? If not later that day, that next day. You know, oh, your yeah. hormone ghrelin is going to surge and it's going to make you feel more hungry. This is actually one of the big criticisms that there is about intermittent fasting is that it creates this kind of cycle that people experience where they don't eat anything for like two days a week. And then the third day, they just kind of eat everything. And that's what you really need to avoid it. And this is why you need to make sure that it's, you know, kind of both sustainable and it's being done correctly. It's not, you know, being privy to just like, you know, eating whatever you want on those off days. It's kind of monitoring this. And again, still also not starving yourself. You know, right. it's kind of readapting yourself to what a fast is and what how that might help you lose weight. Well, and, and just to clarify here, because um, every time you've said it, like the five days, two days, you don't have to do both of those days at the same time. You can do like two days of normal, one day of fasting, two days of normal, one day of fast, like some, yeah. a cycle like that. So it's not like for two days, you're only allowed 500 calories each day and then you can eat normal the rest. Uh, you, you can swap it somewhat. Um, yeah. I, I, that, I keep gravitating to the five, two, cause that's how most of the research protocols, like the randomized clinical trials that have looked at this are mostly this like two days of continuous when they do the modified 
um, fasting right. regimens. But you are right. Like there are, you know, that's another form of intermittent fasting where you could, you know, eat normal for three days, fast for a day, eat normal for two days, fast for a day, and kind of cycle it that way as well. Um, this is where I think people bring up the idea of compliance and, you know, is this something that people can stick to? Mm -hmm. We do know that there are a lot of studies that show that people who do the intermittent fasting or have days of fast do experience more hunger. Like that's not that it sounds like a, well, duh, obviously, right. but like <laughs> it shows that. So it's not just us saying, oh, that makes sense. Um, research shows that, you know, when you do a fast, you're going to experience severe hunger potentially. And that's why a lot of people drop out of these studies. Um, and so they say, you know, I can't keep doing this. Uh, they might talk about hunger pain. And that could be depending on the study, um, anywhere between like five to like 30, 40% of the participants say, I can't keep doing this. What I do want to say though, is that's not too, um, incomparable to the people who are on the continuous energy restriction. So when we talk about dropout within a study, any randomized clinical trial, you are almost always going to have some amount of your participants drop out of the study, especially when they last three months to six months. And that's about where most of these studies have looked at are randomized clinical trials between three to six months or so. Some have gone further. There's some that are much shorter. So about that window, you're going to have some people drop out. And we do see slightly more people drop out of the intermittent fasting protocols than, than the continuous. But at the end of the day, any amount of caloric restriction isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be something that is conducive to just everyone getting on board and being like, yeah, no, I'm fine eating less. Yeah. And it, it, it's not, it's not even only just how little you're eating. It's uh, just controlling how much you eat throughout the day. Cause I mean, when I was doing it and I was doing the 500 calories for five days, I wanted to space out my food. So when I did get a little hungry, I could eat like three strawberries and then be like, that's a good snack for now. I'll come back to those in three hours. Like, yeah, and, and I think that's a really big part of it is when people do that one day of fasting, they automatically overeat for like say breakfast and then it's like, okay, well you hit your calorie limit by lunch. So now you're about to fast for 12 hours because you're not getting yeah. dinner and a and, lot and, of people can't it, handle that. It's, it's kind of part of like our normal psychology where if we go without for an extended period of time, we think, oh man, when I can eat. I got to get all this in. Mm -hmm. And um, this is this is partially why. So um, you mentioned earlier, like religious fasts. Um, one of the most ones that have been like observationally studied uh, that happens is during the Muslim month of Ramadan, yeah. uh, fasting from uh, sunrise to sunset. And depending on where you live with the light of the sun, that could be a fast that's anywhere between like 12 to 14 hours all the way up to like 18 hours in a day or 20 hours. But that is also characterized by, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, uh, the meal after the sun sets, I believe it's called Iftar. And that is like, it's a huge feast, right? It's, so yeah, it's, not, a, it's like a celebration. Yeah, it's not something that is um, particularly like people who are fasting for Ramadan aren't going into a clinical trial with the intention of losing weight. So no. it's really hard to necessarily apply some of what we see with like observational fasting days with what people might do in a clinical trial. What I would say is that when you look at when it's in a clinical trial with the options of overeating and people keeping food diaries, you know, we don't necessarily see this overfeeding response that is often talked about where someone doesn't eat a whole lot one day and then overeats the next. Now, you have to take that with a grain of salt because these are all participants who are enrolled in a randomized clinical trial who are trying to lose weight. So their psychology mindset is might be a little bit different than someone who is, you know, at home considering, you know, trying intermittent fasting as a weight loss strategy. It's a bit more structured. And this is why I do encourage anyone who wants to lose weight to, you know, really brush up on some type of either fitness tracker or kind of get an idea of like, what would be their normal calories for a day? Yeah. You don't want to just right off the bat start starving yourself. You want to think, how do I achieve a reasonable calorie restriction that is sustainable? Well, right? I think that's what a lot of people jump into. They're like, oh, I'm going to start dieting. And just the psychology behind that is 
they're going to try and eat less, but they don't even have like their BMR, their basal mo- metabolic rate. So they don't even know how many calories they're actually supposed to be ingest, like getting into their body every day. Yeah. And they just like start cutting calories and it's just willy nilly like, ah, oh, I'm just going to not eat this today. And that's, that's not how it works. That's not how you keep a healthy, sustainable diet. And, and the equations we have that like estimate like how many calories you have, I mean, they're pretty good, but they're not perfect, right? And so that's why there is going to be some bit of trial and error. Yeah. You know, there's a ton of caloric, uh, like they, they calculate your estimated uh, resting metabolic rate or basal metabolic rate based off of your age, height, weight, and sex. And then they kind of factor in, all right, how physically active are you? And then you get this pretty decent predictive estimate of your daily caloric needs. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot out there. Uh, Again, the one that I tend to gravitate to is the the Mifflin St. Jor equation. Um, And I think that that does a pretty good job for the average population, average US population. Yeah. At kind of starting that, all right, so this is approximately how many calories I need. All right, so reduce that by 500, seven days a week. Or, you know, figuring out if I'm gonna fast, what calories like what's that distribution of calories look like for like the five two or the other types of alternate fasting protocols yeah and i mean it's it's really easy to look up and do i just i think a lot of people just are like i feel like going on a diet like especially in january i mean everybody wants to do the new year's thing and do a diet or gyms are full and they just start doing it without looking into these equations and i will definitely put a hyperlink to the equations um, in this video just so that people can really, I mean, you you just type in a few numbers and it pops up with a good estimate. I'm not going to say it's perfect, um, but I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good estimate of your caloric needs. So, and, and, and this is that whole like knowledge is power. Learn more. If all of your knowledge about like calorie restriction, be it continuous or intermittent comes from like looking at a magazine on your checking out in a shopping aisle, you're going to be seeing that shit that's like 10 to 20 pounds lost, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, so like we both know that that's BS. That's not what you should be doing. Right. But again, like trying to learn a little bit more. um, I don't necessarily want to give a shout out to this, but there is a, a new like fitness tracking app that seems a little bit more holistic. It seems very reasonable. They kind of get the psychology of weight loss. Um, What are your motivations for it? Can I? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So um, there was a lot of aggressive marketing with this like Noom. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. Um, And uh, but so I now know a few people who have done it. I haven't looked into it myself, so I'm not at all trying to preface myself as being an expert. But, um, you know, it, it does a really good job at having you all right track your food. It gives you an idea of the calories you've been consuming. It talks about what a reasonable weight loss is being one to two pounds. Um, and, and it is more psychologically based, which I think is a lot of eating. Yeah. Um, obviously, you have the hormone fluctuations, and that's a very real physical sensation when you talk about hunger and fullness. But even just like that mindless eating that we tend to do. Um, especially right, especially right now. Like, uh, I mean, so I have clients right now that they're working from home and they they tell me they're like it's really hard for me to not just walk in and grab a snack and like eat an entire sleeve of saltine crackers while i'm sitting at my desk working from home and yep. i understand that like that I, it's hard for me to not go grab a snack while we're doing this but yeah um, and, and i would say that if you think about that food environment this is where it really is if we jump back to intermittent fasting what works for you right mm-hmm. so like you can change your food environment you can choose not to have these, you know, snacks available, or maybe you move them into another area of the room so that they're not as tempting. And maybe you are good with seven days a week, you know, not eating as much and you're good with the continuous energy restriction. Great. On the other hand, there are going to be some people, like you said, at home surrounded by food, maybe giving them some structure of one or two days a week uh, with a significant fast kind of rebuilding up what this hunger feels like, understanding it, listening to the body might actually be effective for them. Yeah. Right. And I mean, it, it also helps with the, uh, just not eating because you're bored. I, I've noticed that a lot with this COVID going on is people will just, 
they're not hungry, but they're just grabbing a snack while they sit on the couch and watch TV or do whatever they're doing because they're bored. So. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one of those things that when you start to develop, so I was going to say this earlier, it's almost like, so routine is good, but also being able to be flexible is good. Like both of those, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Like you should have a routine, but at the same time, you should be able to be a little bit resilient and flexible with your body. And I'd say the same is true with like being aware of what you're eating. You know, I obviously, you know, as someone who studies nutrition, I think about food a lot. I think about nutrition a lot, you know, anytime I'm eating, but I have to be wary that I don't want to over fixate on it. It's mm -hmm. always a balance, right? So we want people to be aware of what they're eating, but we also don't want them to go too far to one extreme. Maybe yeah. again, I'm Modern watching Avatar and Cora, but like, I'm just thinking balance all the time in my head right now. Like, yeah, I want you to worry about your like food intake, but I also don't want you to be like freaking out to the point of it causing stress and then leading to other unhealthy behaviors. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's literally everything in life. Um, yeah. I think that healthy sleep, a healthy balance of sleep is good. But if you need to stay awake for four extra hours one day to get something done, your body should be able to do that. Like that flexibility is really key for us. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's just the moderation is key thing that you always harp on is, I mean, everything in moderation. That's yeah. uh, everything in moderation, even moderation. Yeah. Like, like, like maybe experiencing a bit of extreme is okay now and then like, right. it, but it's about doing it in like a safe way. So in this case, you know, fasting, be it a religious fast, like we know people can survive on a fast. They can do it for a month. Again, when you look at uh, the number of Muslims worldwide that do Ramadan fasting or even like Judeo-Christian religions that encourage fasting. Um, I, I do think it's something that is something that we can have people experience and it not be something that is like earth shattering to them. Again, assuming that their physiology is OK with it. Again, I will say I know that there are a lot of um, medical and health exemptions for people who do fast, even in Ramadan. Right. And that would be a concern. Like, so if you are someone who is, um, you know, diabetic or has a chronic health condition that might like suggest, hey, don't just jump straight into a fast. Talk with your doctor. Talk with the dietitian first. Right. But it's just another potential modality to maybe consider or engage. Yeah. And I mean, talking about diabetic or diabetes is so... A lot of these looked at kind of how intermittent fasting could affect your body with that insulin response. And we have, we've, we've talked a little bit about it, but is, so we've talked a lot about the weight loss of intermittent fasting and caloric restriction. And, but diabetes is like really, really coming in strong in America right now. Like yeah. it is, the numbers are growing daily of people with diabetes and the number of people dying with diabetes is just insane to me. Is this something that can really help kind of negate the onset of diabetes or kind of help you manage it? So, so yeah, let's touch on the first point that you made just so I can segue into that. Both continuous energy restriction and intermittent fasting both seem to be as effective in these clinical trials at reducing total weight gain, right? So you know, the fact that we have about 60% of the United States that is overweight or obese, uh, one or the other, like this might be just another way for them to kind of gravitate towards that. Obviously, for people who are at a higher uh, BMI or, obese, or uh, going into overweight and obese states, they're more at risk of developing diabetes if they don't have it already. Right. Um, and so one of the first strategies we have for people who are either becoming pre-diabetic or diabetic is typically we think about potential weight loss. Now, again, we know from the get-go that not all diabetic people are overweight or obese or need to lose weight. Right. There's a lot of people who would be a normal BMI and a relatively thin, perhaps, body physique, but for whatever, maybe it's their sugar intake, you know, a lot of other things that are predisposed to this type 2 diabetes. Um, so this is not for everyone, but we do know that there are a lot of people who would be able to manage their diabetes by losing weight. So they definitely go hand in hand on that end. So yes, <laughs> it would be effective. Okay, um, yeah. And the studies are not as clean cut on that end. What we know is that as people lose weight, they're going to typically become more insulin sensitive. Their hemoglobin A1C will go down, which is like a longer term measure of their insulin sensitivity. 
or rather their uh, gl- like glucose concentrations. Right. Um, and so we do tend to see some benefits from this, but they tend to be comparable to the continuous energy restriction. So it doesn't seem to necessarily be better than the continuous energy. Right. There's it's just some research that says it is. <laughs> some studies definitely say, look, oh, we saw that intermittent fasting was significantly better at reducing total insulin levels than the continuous, but that's not all studies. Yeah. And I mean, we haven't really been studying intermittent fasting uh, for that long in the grand scheme of medicine. Uh, I don't think a lot of the studies I saw were not old studies. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the reviews that we, we were kind of talking about, a lot of those studies are, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013. Um, one of the older ones is 98. But most of them have been mid to late uh, 2000s, early 2010s. And I think that that kind of gets to the fact that it's hard to study. You know, diet inherently is really challenging to study because you're asking someone not just to, like a supplement study is easy to do. If you want to go in and be like, here, have this fish oil pill, have this, um, you know, ginkgo biloba, like, you know, any of these herbal supplements, you know, you, you can say, do everything you normally do. You get a placebo, you get this herbal supplement. That's fairly straightforward to do in a study when you're asking someone to change everything about their day because you're saying don't eat what what's the first thing you do when you wake up you eat breakfast well maybe you don't but maybe you get a coffee well then don't get that you're asking people to change not just like literally what they eat but how their day is structured right yeah i mean if on a fast day you have a group of friends that say well we're going to go out to eat you're asking people to be in a study that might say well you you aren't allowed to eat with them on that day yeah, you no, absolutely. Them, but you can't eat. Like, that's something that's really hard to do. So that's that's one of the big, I think, concerns that we have in the research community is as much as we talk about randomized clinical trials often being the gold standard of understanding causal relationships, does intermittent fasting work? Is it better compared to uh, continuous energy restriction? In many ways, they're not always uh, representative of real life. And I think that's where we got to kind of understand that that's where the clinician comes in, the dietitian or the, the doctor, someone who's going to be able to work with you and say, all right, you know, this is what the research shows, but this is how it's going to translate into your life. Like, you know, is this something that you're going to be able to do? Is this sustainable? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think that the way I did it wouldn't be sustainable for a vast majority of people, I just fought my way through it because I mean, like you, if I'm going to talk to people about fitness and diets and anything, I'm going to experience it before I tell you to go do it. That that's yeah. just, I mean, and, and would you say, was it sustainable for months, like years? Like, is it something that you would do? The way over- I did it was the, so I did it for three months and I I don't think I could sustain it, um, but I was also doing the opposite of like the yeah. – I was doing more of a, like a two to five than a five to two. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if it if it came down to that, I think no. But if I changed it to five two, probably. Yeah. And especially with me uh, for like the timed intermittent fasting, I'd be able to do it. Um, Emily wouldn't be able to do something like that. Uh, yeah. She needs – food throughout the day. So it's, yeah. it's just, everybody's got their own thing. Yeah. I, I think that that's like just the, the big crux is like knowing what works for you, but also being honest about what works for you. Cause I think it's, it's easy to say, Oh yeah, I could do that. But then like taking a step back and saying, what does that mean? Like, could I do this as a lifestyle change? Right. Because we don't want people doing a fad diet and only doing it for a month or two months to lose weight. Because then you're just going to go back to your normal behaviors and put that weight back on. And so I, I do try and think a lot about that sustainability aspect of it. Is it something that if you are going to try fasting, is this for the goal of losing weight? Is this something that you would feel comfortable doing for, you know, a year or plus, you know, and maybe you transition from intermittent fasting, but still then when you go back to seven days a week eating, then you adopt the continuous like caloric restriction. Yeah. at what your new normal kind of is so yeah. yeah and i think a lot of it too is like the psychology of it um because when i was doing it i was i was eating snacks but the snacks were like carrots or like i said strawberries or i would have like a muffin in the morning as breakfast 
that was a majority of my calories right there. And yeah. I wasn't eating like a bag of potato chips as a snack, which, and that's, that's where I think the psychology of the diet comes in is once you start doing a life change like this, you're not going to hinder yourself by like drinking Mountain Dew and eating a bag of chips on your off day. Yeah. It's, and yeah, just kind of having an idea of what you're eating and what you're putting in your body. I'm all for, for, you know, snacking and maybe having some less than ideal food here and there. Cause again, treat yourself. Right. Like it's 2020, <laughs> we need to find ways to treat ourselves. Right. Exactly. It, it, it's definitely something that, again, just being mindful, like, do you need this? And I think that's why I like some of the more recent products that are out there that are more like about, all right, what is healthy? What is reasonable weight loss? Not just this crazy, like drop 10 pounds in two weeks. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's, and that's why I really like when we're taught in at WIU, we're, we're, we're told like, Oh, 500 calories a day. That's like a pound a week. That's, I mean, that's four pounds a month. That's, that's fine with me. That sounds like the perfect amount, like losing 10 pounds in a month. One, it's all water weight. It's going to come back. You just like, you got rid of water out of your body. As soon as you drink a glass of water, it's going right back in there. So good, like good luck. But yeah, it's, it's just amazing to me that it, how, how quick and slippery of a slope it is for people to learn a little bit and then take off running. Like, so we're talking about intermittent fasting right now. And I do know a couple people have did, and I might butcher it. It's either like the Simon diet or the Simeon diet. Full disclaimer, don't do it. It's stupid. It's yes. But it's something that like you do for like a number of weeks and every day you take 500 cal. It's like you have at most 500, 600 calories and you take these like human, human chorionic gonadotropin hormones and you take those drops. But it like takes this idea of a fast to an extreme. And it's this idea that like that's starving your body. That's yes, you're going to lose a rapid amount of weight but it's not healthy and it's not sustainable. Right. And that's really like trying to frame fasting in a healthy, um, reasonable way, I think is, is, is the challenge. Because I do know that you hear of someone eating 500, 600 calories on a day. And at first blush, I'm going, whoa, 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 what are they doing the rest of the days? Is this okay? Because we talk about healthy eating behaviors and we are taught so much to be like, three square meals a day plus a snack that it goes against our like traditional mindset. Right. And it's not doing that fast every single day. You're still getting adequate nutrition. You are still eating all of the nutrients that you need and meeting energy needs less than what your normal energy needs are, but not an egregiously lower amount. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, and I think that's really just the key to all of this is intermittent fasting. It's not just fasting. Like, that I is in front of the F for a reason. Like you want intermittent fasting. Fasting is not starving. And that's, that's the big difference. It's, I mean, yes, you are going to have a day or two where you may have, and whether they're back to back or otherwise, where you have very low calories, but again, you want to be eating nutrient dense foods and your body has a phenomenal amount of stored energy on it in the form of fat. Um, and, and so that's really what we're trying to target. So you still want to be eating good nutritious foods on those off days and getting calories still you, again you don't want to starve you mentioned the keto flu earlier you know you're not going to have that glycogen depletion that you have on a keto diet because on your off days you're still eating carbs you're not like severely restricting any one nutrient in the diet um, but it is trying to target this idea of lowering total calories yeah and i think i think that's really just the best way to get weight loss is restricting your overall amount of calories that you put in. But, yeah. um, is there anything else that you can think of that we didn't touch on? I think we, I think we segued through that pretty well with very few tangents. Yeah. I mean, you know me, I'm good at just talking on and on and repeating myself a hundred times. So no, I think, I think we did a decent enough job of all the things I thought had to get highlighted. Cool. All right. Well, thank you again, Eric, for coming on. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that. If you guys have any questions or comments, please leave them down below and we will see you later. Have a good one.